What up, Jack? Yo. Yo. Hey, yo. How are you? I'm all right, man. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Good to see you. I, I feel I love your setup. Uh, and I'm like, don't know what to do with my hands. Just don't hammer the table. Because it goes, it vibrates all the way through. Uh, We've got an audience. We do. Should we say hello to Cookie? Yeah, we got my stepmom, the Bitcoin mom. We got my dad. We got my best friend, strike employee, Dylan. Jack, love talking to you, man. Peter, yeah. Well, first of all, we go way back. We and, do. Uh, I haven't spoken to you since you bought the football club. So congratulations. Thank I'm you. very proud of you, man. We started selling merchandise today. 10,000 pound of merchandise sold in three hours. Amazing. We just need to sell another half Congratulations, million. man. Yeah, but we lost today. We played fucking terrible. Um, I don't think any of the players listened to this, but we didn't play well. But yeah, thank you. I mean, you've known for a long time I wanted to do this. I told you about this. Mm -hmm. And now it's a thing. I know. I'm very, very proud of you. I think sometimes in the Bitcoin sphere time goes really fast a lot of things happen in a short period and uh just so you know i'm very proud of you thank you man. and uh seeing it all come together was really cool it's inspiring for me shut up man fuck off you fuck off the <laughs> fuck just be go fuck myself just be a good guy hey listen i'm really proud of you though as well you've been through a lot this last year or so uh you are a global bitcoin superstar you're crushing it love every performance from the the uh closet Mm -hmm. In the Crocs, <laughs> in the hoodie, talking to uh, national TV stations. Uh, there's a lot to talk about, man. Mm -hmm. I don't even know where to start. I think we have to start with the IMF. Let's start with the IMF. Just because that's funny as fuck that you're dealing with the IMF. Yeah. Um, What's the background? Well, the IMF uh, reached out to my press team. And they're just like, uh, hey, we're really interested to hear... Uh, Jack talked to us about Bitcoin and the Lightning Network. Supposedly, there's this 27-year-old that's disrupting cross-border payments, and we need to know about that. And uh, my general counsel was very nervous. I was like, I don't know if we should do this. Uh, this is the IMF. Uh, she used to work at the World Bank. And my immediate response was like, fuck yeah, I'm doing this. Yeah, of course you are. Of course I am. Um, doesn't matter. Uh, and so, yeah, they were just super interested to have a seminar I think it was over 100 uh, in attendance from the IMF. And it was just about lightning in the future cross-border payments. And uh, there was a very famed, I think what went viral on Twitter was the tortilla chip and the peanut and the raisins. Um, but yeah, no, the, initially the Bitcoin community was like a little hesitant to me speaking to them and stuff, but I'm a, I orange build the fuck out of them. Um, I have an email. I asked my lawyer if I could publish it. And uh, she said no, um, but <laughs> I didn't ask her um, if I could read it on your podcast. So she hasn't said so no. So she hasn't said she no She hasn't yet. said no. That's pretty much a yes in my books. That's what I thought as well. Um, let me find it. Oh, I got it. Okay. So a lot of these stories I'll, I'll tell today, I can't mention too many names for obvious reasons and stuff. But uh, this is a executive at the IMF after my presentation uh, emailed. Dear, Dear Jack, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to thank you again very much for yesterday's seminar. You were extremely clear with a welcome touch of humor, referencing the tortilla chips and the peanuts. And the seminar was a huge success. Your insistence on leveraging Bitcoin as a network rather than purely an asset was a novel idea and for many of us, extremely appreciated. I think it was also refreshing for people to see such a talented and passionate young entrepreneur. Skip that part, wink. Um, this is the cool part though, from the IMA. Okay. Personally, I'm convinced you're onto something essential. That is leveraging a global settlement asset and monetary network. In short, Bitcoin has replicated the arrangements that make payments very difficult within countries, across borders, and between legacy institutions. And your mission with Strike is to deliver an experience and drive that mission forward on top of Bitcoin. And then it goes on for a very long time. The email's very long. But as an executive at the IMF that now understands that Bitcoin and Lightning allow for a superior cross-border payments experience, um, 
which is remarkable. Uh, so I feel like the world should know that. If I get in trouble for reading that, we'll see. We'll see. Not sure I care anyway. Well, listen, but they only recently came out and told Bukele to sell his Bitcoin, so. Um, what do you think's going on with those guys? With the IMS? Yeah. Do you think they've, they're, they're realizing this is something they can use or? No, I mean, so the language with me was supposedly you're making cross-border payments instant and free. Uh, what can you, you mind explaining that, Mr. Tough Guy? <laughs> and so, and so uh, I explained it. Now, their relationship with countries, with lesser developed countries, with emerging markets is pretty known. And Bitcoin poses a pretty serious threat to the business that they do. So I, I, I don't think it needs to be analyzed much more than that. But I wonder, is it something they will be considering promoting, pursuing, using, talking to other countries about saying you should consider adopting this technology? Uh, I think so. A, a large part of my presentation was not only about the efficiencies when it comes to speed and cost, which is kind of like the headline, like Western Union is a week and 20% and lightning is free and instant. Um, but there's an also uh, more potentially more important undertone, which is the inclusion that's involved. Uh -huh. So a lot of the IMF's relationships with these smaller, lesser developed markets, there's a massive financial inclusion problem. And when I went through the tortilla chips and the peanuts and the raisins, it was very clear to see the inclusion that this monetary network allows for, um, which benefits everyone. Um, and so I'm, I'm hopeful. I mean, we're talking about a legacy institution that has a reputation and existing relationships uh, that outdate my life by a long mile. And so um, I don't think that a presentation by me is going to change things overnight. But in my opinion, you know, some of the feedback I got is <laughs> you're gonna give the IMF our secrets. Don't tell them that the secret ingredient, don't tell them where grandma hides the sauce. It was like, get the fuck out of here, guys. Like, we're not going to change the world because we're able to obfuscate a secret from the IMF. I'll sit across from anyone and tell them why Bitcoin is the biggest thing that'll happen while they're alive. I don't care who you are. And the best outcome for me is for them to understand it if I did a good job at that. And I feel like I did. And I feel like they now know why Bitcoin and Lightning is important. And what I told them, I was very persistent on you don't have to think Bitcoin's going to the moon. If you think Bitcoin poses a threat to the dollar and you don't like it for that reason, I disagree with you, but that's fine. Bitcoin and Lightning as a monetary network, there's no better way to escrow and settle value, period. Any monetary network in the world. It is the best monetary network at allowing for physical cash finality globally, period. And now whether you want to interface that over dollars, over Starbucks points, or use Bitcoin, the native asset within the network, is up to you. And they got that. And that, to me, was huge. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know like, when that would materialize in, in a way where in which we'd see them encourage Bukele, right? Like, mm -hmm. I, don't, I, I don't even know if it's helpful to speculate on that. But uh, I feel like Bitcoin made tremendous progress. And now that the IMF understands that Lightning is better than Western Union. Do you know what the two most important factors that go into making this show a success? What? The table, that's number one, and sometimes the show title. You know what the show title is gonna be, don't you? How Jack orange peeled the IMF. You, you get a show title wrong, you get 20% listeners, less. Well, yeah, so I, I also have like, come into the show, I was telling Dylan on the way here, a little bit of a, a calmer demeanor. I'm usually like, right, like, fuck, fuck, fuck this, shit. fuck them. Yeah, I've learned a lot in the last, I don't know, being a CEO of a company teaches you a lot of things. But um, I, have a, I have crazier stories. The story, so... Well, let's go back a step. Firstly, this IMF one, was this the one where you changed the front cover to the presentation? Oh, my God, yeah. So they, so they, get, they titled my own presentation. <laughs> and it was, it was uh, strike, disrupting cross-border payments, question mark. And so they got two things wrong, in my opinion. First of all, it's, it's Bitcoin that's disrupting cross-border payments. And I can get to, I have these long-tailed thesis on how the world's going to evolve and, and, and why that's accurate and stuff. Um, but I changed strike to Bitcoin, 
which as the CEO of Strike may sound strange, but it's not. And it's, and it's also just me being honest and true. And you remove the motherfucking question mark. I remove the question mark. Fuck yeah, the of course. Mark. Well, I mean, at, at this point for me, it's a science. There's, there's no other monetary network that can escrow value across borders more efficiently, cheaper, faster, better. Um, oh, by the way, Peter, in order to accomplish this, it is implied that the asset within the monetary network is natively digital. In order for it to be natively digital, right? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm describing Bitcoin. It has to be censorship resistant. It has to be resilient to any oversight or regulation. It has to know no borders. It has to have you know, a base layer that optimizes around security and robustness, and then a standard on top of it that allows for instant and relatively free cash finality. It has to has all, all, all those things. So um, it, to me, it's, um, comparing it to Western Union is only me trying to be relatable to the general public, but to anyone knowledgeable, it's not even close. It's, it's a waste of time to compare the two. What, what was this wider thesis that you had you just mentioned a moment ago? It's, a, it's really like what grounds strike. Um, and I, and people have heard me before refer to like Bitcoin, uh, in the internet. I think there are a lot of similarities. Um, I think that Bitcoin as a monetary network is going to dematerialize all existing monetary networks. And we're going to see a renaissance of innovation, um, for the consumer experience. And there's going to be one of the greater value transfers away from legacy financial institutions onto those that build the best experience on top of the Bitcoin and Lightning Network. And so... Let me demystify that for a sec. Think about it this way. When I go into Starbucks, where's the camera? Salut. I cannot pay for this with my Western Union account, right? When I remit money to El Salvador, I cannot do it with my Visa card. Western Union is a monetary network that's comprised of a lot of brick and mortar physical locations in relationships with correspondent banks across the 190 to 200 countries that are here. And it facilitates cross-border payments. Visa, contrary, is a monetary network that consists of 70 to 80 million merchants, and it helps facilitate commerce between the issuing side, the one paying, and the acquiring side, the one receiving the payment. But Western Union does not allow me to buy coffee, and Visa does not allow me to remit money. What does that say? That says that building monetary networks for these paper dollars, it's so expensive and difficult to solve one particular problem, right? And it prices out your ability to do more than that. Like if Western Union could compete with Visa on payments, they would. If Visa could be the biggest remitting company in the world, they probably would. They can't. It's too expensive, too much fixed costs, too much local regulatory Frame, right? All, all, all these things. Um, Peter, have you used the Lightning Network to buy coffee? Plenty of times, man. Have you used the Lightning Network to remit money? I have been. Effortlessly. Easy. Somehow, there is a monetary network that does both. Effortlessly. Well, like after our trip to El Salvador, uh, usually on all my previous trips, I would have dollars on me. I usually always came from the US first. And this was the first time I went direct. I didn't have any dollars on me. And I didn't need dollars the whole time I was there because the whole time we were in Zante, everywhere accepted Bitcoin. But the point on this was, it, the key point I was trying to make is that it, it was more convenient to use the Lightning Network. That was the flip, that experience there. It was more convenient for the consumer, but the net takeaway is it's a superior monetary network. It's a monetary network that could do what Visa does. It could do what Western Union does. It could do what TransferWise does. It could do what every monetary network does effortlessly all in one. And what's the difference, Peter, when you buy a coffee on the Lightning Network or when you remit money? Is there like an extra form you got to fill out? Is there a license you got to go get? Or is it the same QR code you scan? It's the same. It's the same. What does that remind you of? It reminds you of the early internet. You've heard of these like very early relay chats on the internet, right? Like very um, passionate technologists that were on the internet and creating IRC-like chats in the very early days of the web. Now, what was the difference from me sending a message to someone in the very early versions of the web from Chicago to someone in Japan? What's the difference between that communication being a tweet or a news publication or an Instagram post or a YouTube video, 
right? The internet was a superior communications network that was accomplishing the job of all existing communication networks that were regionalized, local, like in Chicago, they published the newspaper on Sunday. In San Francisco, they do it on Tuesday. And in Germany, newspapers are illegal. And so you send messages with pigeons and the internet gave you a communications protocol that dematerialized all of them onto one, right? And in the early days, it was kind of hard to see that like sending data between each other could be pictures, it could be news, it could be social networks, it could be all of these things but it was a superior communication standard that was open and global. And open networks win for the network effects and the economies of scale. I've talked about this before. And so what I'm saying is that Bitcoin and Lightning is the same for money. Me scanning a QR code to buy coffee, to remit money, to pay for an allowance, to stream to a podcaster, it's all the same standard. It's all Bolt 11, it's all HTLCs, it's all Bitcoin addresses, it's all one. It, does, it knows no relative network to, to the specific job at hand. And so here's what's really, really powerful. What did the internet do to the communications industry? Um, it dematerialized it. Uh, what I mean by that is it took the value in these local bifurcated closed communication networks like publishers, um, newspaper, paper boys, right? The pigeon networks that were flying the notes that the pigeons would spit out at your windowsill. Um, and it, that value that lived, like here's the pigeon network, here's the newspaper network, right? Here's the, right? and it leaked all onto one standard, one network. All that value came onto one. And then the winners on top of the new standard were those that developed the best experience. And the change in that is really strange because all of a sudden, on top of this one giant global standard for the world to communicate. It was about who gave the consumer the best experience, right? Like if Twitter required me to do 25 push-ups before I could tweet, someone should just create one that doesn't. And then I'd go there, right? So you're always optimizing for the consumer experience, whereas before, that's not true. It was really hard to compete with the local newspaper. They already had distribution and the licensing and all the fixed costs that, that had them build the factories, like the Chicago Tribune building in Chicago is one of the big, biggest buildings ever, right? Like they had, right? Um, but then all of a sudden, that wasn't what it was about. It wasn't about who got there first. It wasn't about who had the licensing. It wasn't about who had the distribution and who had the lobbyists in Washington, DC. It was about who built a better consumer experience, which is amazing for the world because now business is optimized around you and I and our experience. And what I'm saying is the Chicago Tribune of today is Chase Bank. Nobody uses Chase Bank because the experience and the brand. I don't know anybody that's like, fuck, I love that experience. That's why I'm a Chase customer. You're a Chase customer because you have to be. But if we have an open global monetary standard, like we have an open global communication standard, and all of a sudden anyone can compete, I would build a better Chase if I could. I'm not a federally chartered bank, and I could spend the rest of my life in DC trying to become one, and Jamie Dimon won't let me it's impossible to compete. So I have to be a Chase customer because I can't compete with Chase. Why, why can't you compete? It's impossible to become, to get all of the necessary licensing, all of the relationships. I mean, Chase and Citibank, it's all legacy financial institutions that are protected by the moat and the cost and the licensing and the relationships in DC. If I wanted to walk into a Starbucks and say, I'd rather pay a different way. I'm going to come up with something else, right? Like, like how do, what Chase does in escrowing it, on the issuing side of payments, Chase and Visa together, I can't compete with that. Um, I was never allowed to um, until now. Now that there's an open global monetary standard for the world, I can remit money better than Western Union. And I didn't have to do dick. They couldn't stop me. Bitcoin's an open standard for the planet to escrow physical value. None you could do about it. In the same way that it was impossible to compete with the Chicago Tribune until the internet. None you could do. I'm going to build something that allows people to publish communication on the web. And people are going to prefer to sit in their couch and read the news instead of go to your physical branch and pick up a newspaper. There's none you could do about that. Right? But what I... What I Chase has never had to compete for the consumer experience. They, 
No one uses Chase because they love the experience and the brand. And what I'm hopeful for is that what Bitcoin and Lightning will do is usher in this renaissance of value transfer from the legacy institutions onto this one singular standard for whoever has the best experience and the best brand. So, Peter, there's not one internet company, right? That would be defeatist of the fact that it's a network. The whole point is there's one global standard, there's one global network that will dematerialize all existing communications, and then it'll be, it'll be home to many participants on the network, right? And so Google, Snapchat, Facebook, these are all, comp they, they all are optimizing and competing for a particular experience. Even at the social media level, the difference between Instagram and Facebook is very apparent and Twitter is very apparent. So when you have all these companies hyper competitive over a particular experience, um, it does great for the world because it makes our lives are being improved every single day. Facebook can't afford to not factor in what I care about. They'd go out of business, right? Today, Chase can afford to not give a fuck about me. Soon they won't be able to. Because in the same way that the communication networks all dribbled and leaked and the value leaked onto one singular global standard and it was up for grabs, whoever can develop the best experience and the best brand was going to be the winners. And we know who they are. Google, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, right? Like email, email services. I'm saying the same is going to happen for money. Now we have an open global standard for money where anyone can compete. And it's better than all the legacy monetary networks. Western Union can't allow me to pay for my coffee. Visa won't allow me to remit money. Lightning does both and better and open and global. And so you guys come play on my court and let's see who can develop the best experience for the consumer. Because I would bet all my life I can build a better experience on the Lightning Network than Jamie Dimon, right? So it used to be, you're not a federally charter, you can't be a bank, Jamie Dimon lives in his own world. You federally charter these nuts now. You gotta come compete. But it makes the, Peter, it makes the world an amazingly better place. Because then all of a sudden, the consumer's experience is constantly optimized for, right? Maybe someone builds a lightning experience that background color is pink, and someone does a certain rewards. Someone lets you spend Starbucks points over lightning. And the consumer gets to elect and choose. And so in the same way that there's not one internet company, there's many. Because what's implied is that there's one global standard and many people come compete for experiences. There's not going to be one lightning network company. That would be defeatist of the whole point. That would imply that I could do a better job at being Western Union and Visa just at strike. No, what's implied is that there's one global monetary standard for the world and that it's going to be the home to infinite amounts of competition for the consumer's financial experience. But this is the first time in human history that there's been an open global standard that allows for free market competition for the consumer's experience. And Jamie Dimon and Western Union and everyone have to compete. And that's the way it should be. And the consumer financial experience is going to get rapidly better like we've never seen before and new services built like we've never seen before. And so I'm of the belief and I've spent my life so far, my adult and life and career pushing for this vision to where Cash App and Strike are rivaling to build the best consumer experience and we're on the same team. Because do you know what? Like it's, it's implied that everyone comes on to the Lightning Network and plays with us. Because there's tens of trillions of dollars that are going to leak out of Chase and Citibank and Visa and dribble down onto Lightning. And they're all up for grabs. Do you, that, do you that feel like, sense? dude? It makes it all makes sense. I feel like not as many people are seeing this wider, bigger picture like you are. I feel like uh, a lot of conversations happen at a more micro level. Bitcoin is a hedge against inflation. Bitcoin is cross-border payments. But n nobody else, or not many people, are stringing the whole thing together and seeing the big picture. And I think if some of them were, some of the bigger companies out there would be rethinking their product. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I took a listen of some of our older podcasts back. And um, what up, Brian Armstrong? When I tried to ex explain Strike and using it for cross border payments, I, I really tried to lean in and be very practical, right? Like there's this famous, like, so at Strike, we debit the dollars out of your account, we turn it over to the Lightning Network, we zip it in. And <laughs> our little Satoshis <laughs> run along the line. Right. But 
<laughs> no, um, the thesis behind Strike and how I see the world panning out and how I plan to make the world a better place has always been grounded in this idea. Um, and that's what I mean by Bitcoin and Lightning are for money what the internet was for communication as you take all the independent, closed, Washington, D.C. protected communication networks, you allow them to just dribble the value out onto one singular global standard and you let the free market decide who develops the best experience on top of them and it makes the world a better place. It makes consumer lives better. Uh, it rapidly increases the rate of innovation. And I think we're going to see that for money. Um, and that's always been why I started Strike. Um, and so, so people are like, why, why does Strike even interface with dollars? Why would you let dollars be spent below over the, of the Lightning Network? And why would you let Lightning Network payments be received as dollars? And for me, it's about building one of what I assume to be the many experiences on top of Lightning. Think about it this way, Peter. Is Google Chrome a piece of shit or is Tor a piece of shit? Tor's kind of a piece of shit. I want to like it more. The I should use it more. The correct answer the is neither. The correct answer is they're both experiences built on the world's global communication standard and some people will use Chrome, and some people will use Tor. And if you're a businessman, maybe there's one that you assess to have a big at mar bigger market opportunity. Maybe your target customer is wealthier. Maybe there's a different business model for each and other. But there is no correct answer to which one's better. They both exist on a free, open, global communication standard. You tricked me. I did trick you. And so what I'm saying with Strike, I think that being able to spend dollars over the Lightning Network and be able to receive Lightning Network payments as dollars is an experience that has a good market. But even as like the kind of freedom fighter that I, I consider myself to be, I have to somehow get Starbucks interoperable with Lightning. I somehow have to get this onto the mainstream. And they love the, these bigger players are very interested in Strike. And, um, but understand what that would do to the world and making it a better place. Right now, when I walk into Starbucks, how do I pay for it? Visa or MasterCard. And the issuing bank behind that is what? Chase Bank, right? And there's no competition. What if I was like, I don't want to use that. I want to use Strike. Like, fuck off. We don't accept that. What if they're interoperable with the Lightning Network? What could I check out with? Anything I want. I could build my own. I could build my own. And Chase is going to have to compete for the experience that I have at Starbucks in that way. And so just by Strike getting... Starbucks interoperable or any large acquiring merchant, right? It enables the consumer's preference to be valued. If I really like privacy, if I'm a Tor browser user and I run a Tor node in my basement and I want to buy my coffee that way, now I'd be able to, right? And so I'm trying to push for greater interoperability with this one standard and expedite the network effects, which in turn drives tremendous value to the consumer. Really, like our, our business thesis at Strike is, let's say the value does trickle out of Chase, trickle out of Visa, trickle out of Western Union, and dribble down onto the Bitcoin and Lightning Network is the one singular standard for the world. Where's the value going to go? And I have the thesis as the CEO of Strike that it's going to go to the best consumer experience, so the best experience for making payments, and then the best acquirer relationships and those that empower those receiving. And so that's why we have two products. We have a Bitcoin Lightning Network wallet that allows you to send dollars over the Lightning Network and buy Bitcoin for free. If you have money to save, you can buy Bitcoin and save it and strike for free. If you have dollars that you need to spend, you can spend them over the Lightning Network. And then as a merchant, uh, you have the API and you can integrate and be interoperable with the Lightning Network and receive dollars or Bitcoin. And that's what's grounded in our, in our business thesis and what drives the two products that we invest our time and money into is that very thesis is that value will dematerialize the Chase Banks, the, the City Banks, the MasterCard, the Visa, the Western Union. That value will dematerialize and be unleashed onto a singular global standard. And we plan on capturing some of it. Hopefully Cash App takes a lot of it, right? Hopefully a lot of part, it, it's implied that it's a network of many participants. The network is defeating all the existing legacy finance institutions. But in order for it to be a network, it has to be a lot of us on there. Um, and how, so anyway. how does that happen? How do we accelerate this? Um, the network effects and economies of scale does do it for us. Um, Strike, for example. So, mer so we're integrating our API into some huge merchants. I, I came to you, I was like, I got some massive fucking announcements over the next few months, but I don't have one for you today. 
Um, tell me after the show. I'll tell you after the show. But for those integrating the Strike API, when Cash App integrates Lightning, they just got 70 million new potential customers. What did they or Strike do for that? Did we like sign a secret deal? Did I cure cancer? I didn't do jack shit. I'm on an open network. And if PayPal comes on or if Facebook comes on, how long until there's more active users that can pay Lightning Network invoices than there are Visa card holders? How would Visa add 70 more million users tomorrow? It's impossible. They can't. And so the open network and economies of scale, here's the other thing too, Pete, is like, the only people in the room that like Visa is Visa. Acquirers don't like paying them, right? And the if I, the issuing side doesn't doesn't like I'm not like loyal to Visa. If someone gives me a better consumer experience, it gives me more rewards that lets me remit money for free that integrates with Starbucks better. I'll use them. But I'm not allowed to right now. That's the thing. Like that's my whole thesis is I'm not allowed to right now. We've never been allowed to until we have an open global standard for the world to escrow money and then compete for the experience. For people that think I'm, I'm an idiot for allowing you to spend dollars over lightning, you should allow people to spend toenails over lightning. And if you're right because of some novel insight, then the free market will correct you and, and, and reward you for that. And that's the world we want to live in. We want to let the individual use their preference to drive market decisions, not Washington, D.C. And so money is still in pigeon land, right? Money is still in New Chicago Tribune newspaper land. And Bitcoin and Lightning is going to allow for this like open network renaissance. And um, yeah, the way open networks work is if you if you don't join or you're late to join, you have the worst, the most to lose. And if you join early and you just interoperate, you have the most to gain. Can Visa join? Yes, I think they will. I think they have to. Visa actually doesn't touch any of the dollars themselves. Um, they just are a network of issuing banks and like merchant acquirers, right? I think. So um, I'll tell the story. So there's a, if I were to say the company and the name of the CEO, you'd lose your shit. Um, so one of the biggest financial companies in the world, um, very reputable CEO. And uh, I was having a one-on-one -on -one with him and I was describing these things because um, I hope he doesn't get mad at me. From, from his words, he's like, everyone can smell blood in the water. Um, if you're vaguely familiar with payments, you know it's ripe for disruption. Um, and hearing about the Lightning Network and its ability to escrow value anywhere in the world instantly for free, consumer to merchant, cross-border payment. Um, it's very clear there's blood in the water, and my job is to not jump ship too early but not get eaten by the shark, right? He's like, there's an art to living through this disruption that I'm trying to figure out. Um, and then... So that was the first thing that I thought was really powerful is that everyone knows and it's more just a matter of time. That's why I really respect Jack Dorsey. Um, it's just a different topic. But then the other thing he told me, which is uh, what I took very seriously, is he like, we, we were conversing. I'm like, lightning and look at all the rewards we could do. Fuck Visa, man. And he took a second, he calmed me down. He looked me in the eye and he said, Jack, I need to tell you something super serious that I want you to take seriously. Jamie Dimon's not going to come compete with you on the Lightning Network. He's never going to win. He's going to compete with you in Washington, D.C. Clearly. And you have to be careful. He was like, take your life seriously. Um, don't give him any leverage. Because as soon as you do get a few big merchants on board and as soon as Cash App turns it on and stuff, he's not going to integrate the Lightning Protocol. He can't build better software than you and Jack Dorsey. He's got no chance. His his business, he was like, you know how much how many days, this is a stat, you know how many days Jamie, oh, this is what he told me, days Jamie Dimon spends in Washington, D.C. a year? 82. He was like, he's going to go to D.C. and compete. So when you guys are designing these protocols, when you guys are making decisions about your life, your business, how to operate, keep that in mind. I took it super, super seriously. So I think the most to lose are those that are protected the most by Washington, D.C. and such, which is, you know, if Visa integrated the Lightning Network, then 70 million merchants would be interoperable. And when I say the value is going to leak to the best consumer experience and the best acquiring relationships, Visa has a lot to win. I may or may not have told them that. Chase, 
The only way for Chase to stay in business and continue to thrive at the top throne that they are is to compete for a better experience. And, you know, everyone's going to have their own speculative opinion on their ability to achieve that, but I'm pretty confident in saying they don't got a fucking chance. So Jamie Dimon's going to have to throw me in jail or else he's done. So we're in a fortunate position that we have Jack Dorsey as such a great ally and a friend of yours. Uh, I'm not going to answer or say anything for him, but him leaving Twitter to focus on this is a very good thing as somebody who has got a lot of experience in the financial sector already with a well-established large company that gives they've probably got a little bit more understanding, a little bit more protection than maybe Strike has now. Because you're like the early rebel. No? Well, yes and no. Yeah. No, there's nothing that you said that was incorrect. But um, we have a lot of it, like, we have, we benefit a lot from being an early rebel. We can do a lot of stuff. Like the fact that- But having both together. Oh, no. Um, I'll leave the context out. Um, but I got a, a DM from Jack one day that um, the first message was nice work. And then the second message was same team with a fist. And um, yeah, in my Forbes 30 for 30 profile, um, I put my dream mentor is Jack Dorsey. I've always looked up to him as an entrepreneur. And um, so that was like one of the coolest moments of my life for sure. Um, but my interpretation of what he meant by that was exactly what I'm describing. And I don't wanna put words in his mouth, so I'll caveat this by saying this is just my own personal stance and vision and viewpoint. But my interpretation of what he meant by that was exactly that. Um, we both have a lot to gain as businesses, but also more importantly, the world and the quality of everyone's life has a lot to gain by if we pop the bubbles of these closed networks and let them spill out onto lightning and let the free market in the world build amazing experiences to pick it all up. And so when people are like, why would Cash App do this? And I think, I think he and Square Block knows that and knows that if there's gonna be many, many winners that get to split tens of trillions of dollars, if all the economic value and legacy financial institutions is popped and milked out and up for grabs. And those that get to win are those that are best at building products and experiences for the world. How much uh, attention are you now paying to Washington? You've mentioned it there. Um, and is there an opportunity or is there a chance that Bitcoin is also in some ways dematerializing the political class there in that we have uh, certainly a number of people within Congress and the Senate now who are uh, big supporters of Bitcoin. I recently saw a great speech by Josh Mandel where he said, if you're for big government and small people, then you should be against Bitcoin. But if you're small government and you feel big people, you should be for, for Bitcoin. Debating Morgan Harper, who also is pro-Bitcoin. We obviously have Cynthia Lammers, who is a big proponent. Even Ted Cruz has you know, put his uh, foot forward. There's, it feels like the game theory within Washington is playing out that some people started to realize, actually, I'm better on team Bitcoin than not team Bitcoin. How much of that are you paying attention to? And Because some people say you should ignore the politicians, fuck politics. And there's other people who are like trying to work with the politicians and engage with them. Um, I don't spend too much time on it, if I'm being honest. Um, and it's because, again, I'm very grounded in this idea that um, here's another like, <laughs> Sorry, I rant so much. Here's another like very deep thought that I've developed over my life that I have very high conviction in. Um, legacy financial institutions were innovating in the early 2000s. There was an effort actually to modernize, to update their technology stack, to build newer experiences as the world evolves. And after 2008 and the economic collapse, it all died. Um, there was too much over-regulation. Everyone's balance sheets got ripped up under them. Some of them went under, right? And innovation died in the legacy institution space. Um, what that allowed for was, in my opinion, a value capture opportunity for startups to pick up the scraps and complete the last lap. And so when you look at Stripe, when you look at Square, when you look at uh, Venmo. Venmo, when you look at Robinhood, all of these companies were founded in the same time. And it was picking up where financial institutions dropped off. And it was, you know, why they drop off. It was effectively their tie to the fiat system. 
um, and and the fiat system let them down, overregulation let them down. And there was a, a massive value capture, capture if you were able to create or invest in Robinhood, in Venmo, in Square, in Stripe, in all of these fintechs is what we call them now. There was a tremendous opportunity to capture economic value there. And I think that that era of finance is over. And what's the new era? Like I like to describe to my team, where is my daughter going to bank in 30 years? Is it going to be at the chase down the street? Everyone's like, no. There won't be a chase down the street. There will be no high street banks. Correct. But where I really drive the point home is I say, is it going to be at Chime? Because Chime invented direct deposit in 2017. If the year's 2040, is my daughter going to bank at Chime? Because in 2017, they came out first with two-day early direct deposit. Is it going to be Cash App? Because Cash App came out with the cash card in 2015. No, she's not going to give a fuck. What is she going to choose? In my opinion, it's the best experience and the best brand on the world's monetary network. That's it. Whoever is able to build the best experience for her, which is rewards, the best engineering, correctly, all of that, and then the best brand, which one does Saquon Barkley use, right? And that's who I think, that's the next value capture, is who can be first to the network effects and economies of scale and who can build the best experience and best brand as the value in these closed, gatekeeped Washington, D.C. protected systems leaks out onto one global open one. And so my time is spent optimizing around the best experience and the best brand. And I'll say this about legal and regulatory and stuff. Um, the first investor meeting I ever had about Strike, uh, he, the guy looked at me, who's now actually my CBO and, you know, like a tremendously smart guy. Uh, smartest guy I've ever met, if I'm being honest. And um, he looked at me and he was like, I think, you know, you're a visionary and I think that you're right. Um, but I'm nervous because you're really young. How are you going to spend three and a half million dollars? And I looked at him and I said, if I'm going to build the best experience and the best brand, I need to overinvest in engineering and I need to overinvest in legal because engineers are going to build the best experience and legal is going to allow us to launch it. And that's it. And he wrote me a check. And so that's what I spend legal time on is just ensuring that we're investing and in being able to release what we build. But that's all I do. Whether who gets elected or whatever, I mean, I, I follow it as a Bitcoiner, but as the CEO of Strike, it doesn't matter. It's, I'm just optimizing my time around Strike being an awesome experience and an awesome brand on top of Bitcoin. How important was the innovation of allowing people to move dollars or fiat currency or fiat denomination across the network? Because... Uh, one of the things that will hold or has held up Bitcoin adoption is volatility. It comes up again and again. You know, if you haven't got a lot of money, it's a bit risky to suddenly buy something that might drop 30%. Um, but if you're able to move dollars across this network, somebody can be using the network without even thinking about Bitcoin. Yeah. Well, so I think, and I can walk through again my evolution that uh, ended up arriving me at Strike. But I think firstly, you have to appreciate Bitcoin as an asset and that, so here, okay. So um, Bitcoin's the hardest money of all time. We agree on that. What do I mean by hard? Hard is a reference to how hard it is to create more of it. How hard is it to create more dollars? It's not very hard. Not very hard, seemingly. If you're the right person. How hard is it to create more penthouses in Central Park, New York? A little bit harder. A little bit harder, but not impossible. If I gave them $500 million, I bet you they'd find me one, right? Of course they will. Okay. So, Central Park penthouses should, in theory, appreciate against dollars. And this whole concept, like Raul Paul, like, well, what about Ethereum's going to appreciate because utility? Do you know the, the highest utility demand token of all time? The US dollar. It has more than a billion daily active users. Are you long that? No. So utility does not inform value or the price of anything. So let's get rid of that nonsensical scamming bullshit. So Central Park penthouses should, in theory, appreciate against dollars. Why? Because they're harder. When my dad was my age, a Central Park penthouse was maybe $500,000. Now, it's probably $500 million. That's in reference to its hardness. How hard is it to create another Bitcoin? It's a trick question. Bitcoin is the only monetary asset in the universe in human history, where it is impossible. Only time ever, ever since the evolution of life itself. So, in theory, 
Bitcoin should appreciate against everything ever. And we're like, well, why is it going down? I don't know. You know the beautiful closet I broadcast out of? The person below me selling their unit. If that person sells the unit for a dollar, does it make my house worth $2? No. Why? I have a beautiful view in a beautiful closet. It's not worth $2. Why would they sell it for a dollar? I don't know. Maybe they're going through a divorce. Maybe they mismanaged their taxes. I feel real bad. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Whatever you're going through, I feel bad. So if someone sells a Bitcoin for $30,000, $30, does it make mine worth $30,000? No. For the only monetary asset in the universe's history since life itself existed, there's never going to be another? No. It's not worth $30,000. For those out there selling it for $30,000, I feel so, I'm so sorry about that. I feel terrible. So, okay, that's Bitcoin, the asset. So the individual's personal preference to have exposure to Bitcoin, the asset, is up to them. Peter, all this mic equipment and shit could be Bitcoin if you want it to. You don't want it to, okay? Right? Like, you can go all in on the Bitcoin standard. You can own none of it. It's up to you. Don't matter, okay? And so that, for me, is like, okay, that's Bitcoin, the asset. What about Bitcoin, the network? What about the fact that there's never been a monetary network that allows for free, instant, open, global value transfer that's cash final, instantly no cost, right? Like, what about that? And so for me, there was actually an experience in the early days of the Lightning Network, there was someone that was testing it with me. This was a la 2016, February. Um, no, no, because Mainnet wasn't, 2017, um, where they were in London and they're like, dude, we should do the pizza thing uh, like, you know, the Bitcoin pizza yeah, story, yeah. but we should do it for Lightning. Like, I don't think anyone's ever bought anything material on the Lightning Network. At the time, there was this coffee shop online that Async was running, but it was on Testnet. It wasn't like real physical goods. He's like, we should, like, you should send me a Lightning payment and send me your address and I'll order you a pizza. And it'll be the first Lightning Network payment for something real. Two Papa John's? Yeah, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Fuck's sake, come on, man. Uh, and so I sent the payment. It got to London instantly and for free, okay? Mm -hmm. um, we didn't sign any MSAs. We didn't, there's no like paperwork we had to exchange. Um, the actual thing that was sent over that monetary network was as valuable in Chicago as it was in London. It carried so much value that he was confident to give me a physical good or service for it, which was pizza, okay? So we just did something in, in, out of my bedroom that Western Union, Visa, none of these people could do. And that's a cross-border commerce payment for a physical good or service, instantly and at no cost. And I sat to myself and I was like, Am, I'm either a fucking idiot or I'm using something that's going to dematerialize all payments, period. Like this feels like magic to me. And I went through this mental exercise. Why is no one using this? Why aren't merchants accepting payments for free? Why is anyone paying fees for cross-border payments? And I end up working myself through, the first and foremost is nobody wants to spend Bitcoin, Peter. If it is that hardest asset ever that I just walked through, why would you ever spend it? So your non-working capital, capital that you don't need to spend to live, should be saved. And according to what I just spelled out, there's nothing better to save it in. Sure, it's volatile, doesn't matter. All your, all, everyone in college that's going studying economics, drop out, it's over, it's over. Bitcoin, hardest money ever. There's nothing else to invest in. It's over. And whether it takes you 10 more years to figure that out or, or you realize it now, whatever, don't matter. Okay, so why, don't ever spend it. Also, it's volatile. Also, there's tax consequences. Also, it's complicated to use. And so I had this revelation of, do you know what Starbucks wants? They want to be able to accept these payments as dollars like they do Visa. And if Starbucks wants to then just go buy Bitcoin with it, they should, whatever. But if they're like, fuck Bitcoin, Jack's an asshole, I'm never buying it. Okay, I don't give a fuck. I'm just making the escrow of value better. So that transaction from Chicago to London for pizza could have been dollars, then turned to Bitcoin, got to London, turned back into pounds. I just fucking crushed Western Union and Visa instantly. And so it, at Strike, that's our bread and butter is allowing, so the non-working capital, capital that you want to save, we let you get paid in it, DCA into it, and buy it for free. I think that you should be able to get into Bitcoin at no cost. And then the working capital, capital that you need to spend to live, that you will not be saving, the dollars in your account that need to go elsewhere for goods and services should be spendable over the Lightning Network. And as a merchant, to be able to receive payments from any interoperable service all over the world, you should be able to accept them as dollars. 
If there's an Australian company that lets you spend Starbucks points over Lightning, there's a company that lets you spend Bitcoin over Lightning, there's a company that lets you spend British pounds over Lightning, you come, it comes in as clean dollars. And then if you want to buy Bitcoin with it, do it, no, right? And then all of a sudden, I've just outcompeted Western Union. And so that's kind of like how I walk myself um, to there. There's actually one, one more, sorry. <laughs> it's an amazing story. Tell me. So, so I, I, this took me months, right? Like long time. And the product of moving dollars and fiat currency over the Lightning Network is so fucking complicated, Peter. It involves really complicated accounting, compliance, legal, overall regulatory, very sophisticated engineering, and a lot of sophisticated trading. It took me a long time. And even getting to this idea took me years. And so Dylan, who's sitting over there, is my, my best friend. Um, I had a hunch about this. And so what I did is I went to a local bar that he introduced me to in Chicago. And I said, you guys are going to accept Lightning Network payments for drinks tonight. And I, right, I convinced them to do that. And they were like, I don't want to touch the Bitcoin. We'd have to convince our CFO, right? Like, and it's volatile and all this stuff. And I was like, no, no, no. The Bitcoin's going to go to my Lightning node. And I'm going to give you dollars on the spot that it arrived to me. So all you get is dollars, like you do Visa. I'm going to deal with all of that. And I did it all manually. And I built a website that allowed people from anywhere in the world to buy beers for the bar that night. And so all of a sudden, everyone at the bar was like drinks on the house or people from Australia, from UK, from Nigeria, buying beers online for this bar. How is that possible? I thought a Nigerian payment to the US takes a week. No, not on the Lightning Network. And so I was streaming these payments at the bar and it was coming in from, from this wallet, from that wallet, from all over the world. And I was getting all the Bitcoin and I was giving the bar dollars manually. And that's when I realized that is the most innovative thing of all time. They receive dollars, they never touch Bitcoin, they need to deal with the volatility, any of that shit. And I had a service that made them interoperable with the world. And cross-border payments, local payments, big payments, small payments. I was, that day, just me, myself, running around, handing the bartender the dollars as the Bitcoin comes in and stuff, I was better than Visa that day. And so then Strike was automating it and building it with software. But that day was like the first day where I was like gonna test this out. And it was the craziest thing ever. People were giving dollars to this bar from Australia instantly and for free. And you're like, how the fuck dollars can't move that fast? It's a piece of paper. I'm like, no, but it comes in as Bitcoin and I just handed them the dollars, you know what I mean? Danny, we need more Bitcoin. We need more Bitcoin. Stop it, Jack. <sighs> okay, man, uh, I'm with you. <laughs> I'm with you the whole yeah. way. Tell me the peanut story. Yeah. We were meant to get to that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, for those that don't know, in my presentation to the IMF, um, I simplified Lightning uh, and, and explained it to the IMF. It's on YouTube. You should watch it. It's a public video. Um, and I explained to them Lightning with tortilla chips, raisins, and peanuts. And I had referenced this real story that this actually happened in someone's house. Um, and so it's easily probably the craziest 36 hours of my entire career. So the only person, or I don't know, I have to be very careful naming names, but the person I will name is Wences Casares. Are you familiar yeah, with Yeah, of Wences? course, yeah, yeah. So Wences now is like a super, super close friend of mine. I have a lot of love for Wences. And actually he was the only Bitcoiner that I know of that publicly apologized, apologized yeah. about Segway2x. So, Wences has done more for this industry and he's done so much for my career already in our short history as friends. And uh, I love that guy so much. And so he uh, reached out to me and said, hey, Jack, um, I think you're really onto something with your whole vision of lightning and Bitcoin dematerializing Chase and City and stuff. And I want to host a dinner in San Francisco um, with some big names because I want them to hear this. And the best thing I think I could do is give you the audience to say what you've been saying to the people that need to hear it most. And I said, okay, that sounds good to me. Like I said, I'll sit and explain anyone, like whether it's a fucking dying grandpa or the IMF or, or a dinner, I'll do it. So I got, I went to San Francisco and I went and at this dinner, no names, uh, top executives at Facebook, top executives at Google, uh, Neil Ferguson was there. Um, Capital Group manages two and a half trillion dollars worth of assets. And uh, 
yeah, I was, I was, I went with my CBO and, uh, he was like, <laughs> he was like, Hey man, you know, this is a different audience than like out of the closet. Like you think you're going to tone it down. And I was like, you know, the answer to that, I'm not going to tone it down. And so, yeah, we go in and there's, there's a, it was a big dinner. It was awesome. And again, shout out to Wences. And, uh, we just talked about exactly this, the dematerialization, how people need to be interoperable with lightning, how everyone has something to gain by integrating lightning, by the way. The only people that don't have anything to gain are those that don't want to compete for the experience, which is Chase. Even if you're Visa, you have something to gain. And I was explaining to Google and Facebook and everything. And someone asked me, this is just like a tangent of the story, but this is a true story. Um, asked me like, what about DM and Facebook and like Libra and all that they are doing? And I looked around the table and I looked at the Facebook executives and I said, you guys are just doing it wrong. Um, and I said, you're competing with the Federal Reserve. Why are you doing that? You have the right energy and the wrong solution. Effectively, if you think of Facebook as a country, it's the biggest country in the world. There's four, four population of four billion. And Zuckerberg's effectively asking to be the central bank of that country and issue them money. No one's going to let him do that. Or by the time he could do it, it's over. It's 10 years from now. So you guys, why are you competing against the Fed? You don't want to compete against the Fed. Why don't you compete against Western Union? You could kill Western Union tomorrow if you integrated the Lightning Network and remitting money was sending a text on WhatsApp. Dead. If it's about the best experience and the best brand, when I walk into Starbucks, do you think that Facebook can be competitive with all their talent and distribution and existing brand and people checking out at Starbucks with Facebook? You just are miss, miss sizing up the opportunity, guys. The opportunity is that there's now an internet, but for money, and you already have everything in your power to build one of the best experiences and best brands on it. So stop competing with the Fed. You're wasting your time. All these leg legacy institutions are dead if you buy into Bitcoin and Lightning. And then a week later, <laughs> my CBO who was at the dinner was like, dude, <laughs> look at this. And it was news. Facebook kills DM. And like all these people are leaving. <laughs> and um, Sold the technology to Silvergate, right? I don't know. Mm, uh, I saw that. I don't know if I, whatever. I, everyone was like, man, you really orange filled Facebook because... <laughs> They killed the M uh, a week after you told them to. So anyway. So we're going to get the Lightning Network in the metaverse. I'm not going to comment on who we're... Uh, I'll just tell this. So, so we're at the dinner and, uh, and C Capital Group managed two and a half trillion dollars worth. And I was like, shit, man, like this guy's sitting across from me, two and a half trillion dollars. And uh, I was like, fuck, I don't know what to say to this guy. Like, do I like, fuck Western Union, you know what I mean? And he comes up to me and he's like, nudges me. He's like, Fuck Western Union, man. He's like, Russell Okung, the GOAT. Pay me in Bitcoin. And I was like, oh, yeah, all right. Like, this is my crowd. And uh, so then after the dinner, I get a text that was like, hey, someone at Capital Group um, really wants to meet you. He manages the biggest team there. And uh, you got to explain to him the Lightning Network. He has someone that he wants to introduce you to. And trust me, you're going to want to take this. And so this is the next morning. My flight was later that night. And I was like, ah, I got to fly. And they're like, Jack, if there's a meeting you got to take, it's this one. So uh, again, we this dinner, Google, Facebook, all these big wigs there. I sit and say like, Bitcoin and Lightning is the only thing. If you're into NFTs or you're into DM, you're fucking wrong. And this is why. And they're like, damn, yeah, okay, good point. You're right. And then the next morning is like, you got to get to this meeting. Like, we totally get it. You orange pilled us. Please show up. I call an Uber. It's Uber driver named Lex who recognized me. And I was like really late. I was like trying to rush, get my shit. I was got to make a flight. And he's like, you Jack from Stripe? I was like, yeah. He was like, dude, I'm a huge. I was like, dude, I'm so down to do whatever after. But like, you got to get me to this house as fast as possible. This is the biggest meeting of my life, supposedly. And this guy is just like, you know, cutting corners and stuff. He gets me there. He drops me off. And uh, all I knew is that this capital group guy is just a big wig. And so I, I walk into the house and he... <laughs> He throws a beer at me as soon as I walk in. Never met this guy. I didn't even know if he knew my name. I'm dressed in sweats, by the way. If I had something nicer, I would have. I, I just wasn't packed for it. And I'm wa I wa <laughs> walk in, he throws me a beer, and he looks at me. The first thing he says, he goes, let me give you some advice, kid. 
making money is awesome. It solves a lot of problems. And I'm sitting in this big house of this guy in a suit and I just didn't say anything. And he's like, you know what doesn't solve? Renewing your daughter's fucking passport. And I was like, what? And he's like, dude, I've been trying to renew my daughter's passport. We have this trip to Cabo and my wife said she was going to do it. She didn't fucking do it. And like, and, she, and, he, and I'm just like, should I open this beer? Like, what the fuck is going on? I have no idea where I am. And uh, so he's like, you hungry? You want any snacks? I'm like, no, I'm not really hungry. He's like, well, I am. And he gets tortilla chips with salsa and trail mix. And he's like, all right, let's go in my living room. I heard you're a smart guy. And we go in and he's like, my name is blank. And uh, I manage a team that actively manages about a trillion dollars within Capital Group. I've been there probably older than you're, how old you are since you've been alive. He's like, I'm 27. He's like, yeah, I'm closer, approaching like 30 some odd years at, at Capital Group. And, and so then uh, he's like, all right, so supposedly you're going to like dematerialize payments and shit, or you have this crazy idea, like go, like you got the mic. And uh, I start trying to explain it. And uh, his wife comes from like the stairs and is like, blank, should I cancel dinner? Who's this guest? You didn't tell me you were having guests. Like 45 minutes. And, I, and it, his daughter's like, daddy, I'm going to dance. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? And he's like, yeah, I'll be there. And then he pauses me. He's like, one second. The guy who leads payment analysis, it lives down the street. Can I invite him over? And I'm like, yeah, but like supposedly we're cutting on time, dude. Like you can get me fucking killed in this house. And the guy comes over. So I'm sitting next there. There's a couch here. I'm sitting on a couch, There's two suits and these snacks. And I'm like, yeah, lightning and dematerialization and Bitcoin. And I'm looking at him and they're like, this kid's lost it. And so then I pause and I just think to myself for a second, I look at him, I'm like, you guys are thinking I'm crazy, but just trust me on this one, okay? Just follow. And I take the tortilla chips and I just dump them all out on the table. And I take the trail mix and I dump it all out on the table. So God knows, and there's like art on the table, like God knows how expensive this shit is, right? And I'm like, this is the legacy financial system. And I look at the payments guy, I'm like, you, you know this, right? I'm like, this is Visa and this is Chase, right? And this is the consumer making the payment and this is Starbucks. And I was like, and a raisin is dollars, okay? And the consumer wants to send the dollar and the Starbucks wants to receive the dollar, but in the middle are all these legacy tortilla chips and I poured a shit ton of raisins on them all. Like they got all this rent to pay, right? Western Union, what do you think Western Union's rent is to have like 500 locations in 200 countries? Like they got rent, they got fixed costs, they got balance sheet float. Like how many dollars does Chase have sitting around that's bleeding away and losing to inflation? They got all this muck and shit like that. I'm like, that's how someone buys coffee. And I, or remit money to El Salvador, right? For the IMF, I did El Salvador. And I bring it down and say, that's legacy, okay? Now I'm gonna put a tortilla chip here that's me trying to send money to El Salvador. I'm gonna put a tortilla chip here that's the El Salvador recipient. And I picked up a peanut. I was like, this thing, magic. Dude, I'm talking to a guy that manages trillion dollars and fucking peanut in his face. I'm like, this thing's magic. Because let me tell you something. This peanut can get from this tortilla chip to this tortilla chip with nothing in the middle. Fucking at the speed of light. This tortilla chip is like out of a, out of a movie, bro. This, tor or this peanut fucks. This peanut's magic. This peanut does shit that raisins can never do. And they're like, what is this kid talking about? I'm like, this peanut can go from Chicago to El Salvador to Bitcoin Beach instantly for free. But nobody wants to use it because everyone's allergic to peanuts. No one wants to touch the peanuts. And so I took a raisin and I put it on the tortilla chip and I took a raisin and I put it on the tortilla chip. I was like, what if the tortilla chips, all they did was interface with raisins? That's it. And we just used the peanuts to get rid of all the muck up there. The peanuts, you don't have to love peanuts or like die hard for peanuts or libertarian as fuck for peanuts. Don't matter. The peanuts do the job of all the legacy muck, the Chase and Western Union and the Visa that I described up there. So this tortilla chip can pledge to spend a dollar. It could turn to a peanut, zip anywhere in the world, zip to any merchant, do anything it wants. Magic. Nothing before like it. And then we just turn it back into a raisin and give it to the end tortilla chip. And there's no muck in the middle. And then the winners are whoever provides the best experience for the tortilla chips. And they were like, holy shit. And then he looks at me and he's like, I have to introduce you to Jeff. 
And I was like, I know that he had in- wanted to introduce me to someone else or something. And I'm like, Jeff, Jeff. And he's like, yeah, the one who founded Amazon. And I was like, fuck. And he got his phone out and he texted Bezos right in my face. And he's like, you got to talk to this kid. And that's my story. And now this gentleman actually- You can't stop there. No. Fuck off. And then uh, actually this gentleman got uh, permission uh, to invest in Strike. And so now we're working with him on some some pretty cool shit. When do I get the uh, post text message to Bezos story? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm working like really hard on uh, integrating as many people onto this monetary network as I possibly can. Because again, I think like for the people on Bitcoin, <laughs> we'll play Twitter, Jack. yeah, well for I, yeah, that's so anyway, that's the tortilla chip. Where's the camera? That's the tortilla chip raisin and peanut story. The peanuts were Bitcoin and they just dismantle the legacy financial intermediaries. And if there is a market for people to live solely on peanuts, like the Bitcoin standard, do it. If tortilla chips want to interface with raisins, if tortilla chips want to interface with Starbucks points, the free market will decide that. And I think that's great. Um, but yeah, for Strike, like a lot of big time merchants and companies, um, they can't interface with peanuts yet or they don't want to yet and such. And so I'm working to get them interoperable with peanuts. And um, I think it's going to be an amazing thing for the world because the day that I can walk into a coffee shop and I could use a lightning note over tour to pay it and use whatever my consumer preference wants would be like a really, 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 really beautiful day for humanity. So I'm just trying to work really hard on getting us to that point. You're making my job very easy today, by the way. <laughs> I'm not having to do much. Uh, talk to me about Argentina. Yeah, uh, successful launch. Um, I mean, from a high level, one of the amazing things about the Peanut Network is it works everywhere in the world uh, natively. It works the same in Argentina as it does right here in Malibu. And so one of the thesis we hold at Strike is we should just be in as many markets as we possibly can. Uh, it's something that legacy institutions can't do. So Argentina was next, and we actually have clearance to launch in a lot more countries, so we probably will over the coming weeks or months. Uh, I'm just a big fan of uh, iterative product process and learning from launching. I don't think that there's a lot to gain from moving too fast. Like clearly I'm in this for the long haul. Clearly I'm in this to compete for the experience and the brand that my daughter will have in 2040. So I'm not like, my daughter's not gonna look back and be like, you you fucking idiot. Why didn't you launch in a country on February 5th instead of February 20th, right? Like she's, <laughs> so, you know, we're just monitoring Argentina, seeing how it's going. And uh, we're gonna launch in hopefully 50 countries this year, 100 countries this year, I don't know. But uh, Argentina was wildly successful. I mean, I think within the first two weeks, we got over 100,000 uh, downloads and registrations and users signed up. So um, it's really, uh, it, I mean, I don't know, it was, it was awesome. Is there any like interesting data of people in El Salvador interfacing with people in Argentina? Uh, there definitely is, not that I have off the top of my head. Um, but no, the, I mean, we're seeing a tremendous amount of success. I guess, I guess like one of the interesting things, and I've heard Michael Saylor talk about this before, is um, these people uh, have a high demand for dollars. And it's interesting because as a Bitcoiner, I know Bitcoin is the hardest asset and what I say, since life itself. <sighs> um, and I, I know that. Um, but these people are interesting because they don't have the non-working capital to sustain the volatility of holding the hardest asset ever. Um, these people live paycheck to paycheck, right? And so they actually love dollars. Um, it's actually Tether on Tron that's the most popular because Tron isn't used for NFTs and shit, right? So the fees are low, like, I've, like crazy shit. But anyway, um, I I've found it interesting. So that what Strike does is instead, I had to replicate a dollar balance in Argentina for them somehow. It doesn't mean no good to give them pesos. I wanted to give them a dollar balance that they could spend and receive over the Lightning Network, like I just described to you. And so the most effective way for us to do that is via stable coins. And so what I found really fascinating is yes, the product is very successful. Like lots of people use it. We're in top of every app store we launch in, all that shit. But what I think from a macro level, one of the more interesting insights is that stable coins are a really interesting way to meet the demand that the dollar has in parts that aren't the United States. And if uh, like Silvergate acquiring DM and what Facebook had, I think is uh, 
really interesting. There's a market opportunity for someone regulated to create a stable coin interoperable over Lightning um, and distribute it to parts of the world that um, are in high demand for dollars. And so that was like one of the main takeaways I had that I thought was really interesting. Well, I had a conversation with somebody recently talking about dollarized nations and why some governments choose to dollarize. And also with Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin is decentralized Bitcoin standard, whereas gold failed because it was centralized. You can operate on a Bitcoin standard. I can, Cookie can, Danny can. We can all choose to and just live our life that way. With these stable coins, there is an opportunity for countries to dollarize bottom up in that the local, like if you're in Turkey right now, you don't want the Turkish lira because it's fucked. Yeah. You want you want dollars. And a lot of people, like Glastin talks about this, in these challenging economic environments, in some ways, Tether or stable coins are in some ways far more important than Bitcoin. Yeah, well, they're just different. But I think what's interesting is traditionally how does someone in Argentina get dollars? Let's start there. Um, you can get them from the government, uh, but there's capital control restrictions. So if you're lucky and if you're elite, you can get $200 a month. That's it. And if you're not like an elitist, you're not allowed to get dollars from the government. And so they're traded on the black market and the black market values a dollar twice as much as the official rate. Um, and so what's interesting about a stable coin, but I was able to give hundreds of thousands of Argentine citizens dollars. How? Because I distributed it through a consumer application via stable coin. But can they not block your app in the local app stores? Have they not? No, I mean, so, so like, like I said, I mean, we invest uh, a lot in legal, not because I'm a legal maximalist. It's because I want to launch the shit that I build. I want my opinions to live in the free market and exist. And so, no, we did everything that we were supposed to do to launch in, in Argentina. Um, and so I just found, I just find that really interesting is that like distribution of dollars, like Michael Saylor's talked about this all the time is that like the U S government shouldn't fear Bitcoin because Bitcoin over lightning gives and, and with a stable coin gives max distribution to meet the global demand for dollars. Um, and I'm not actually going to like comment more on that unless you want me to, but that's kind of like Michael's idea and some people's idea. And uh, in Argentina, I just think it's interesting because people that want to have spendable dollars over lightning, they can hold it on strike. And if they want to hold Bitcoin, they should just hold Bitcoin and never spend it and put it under their mattress in the cold cart or something, right? So. How are you managing the workload? <laughs> you must be, well, I know you, I know you're busy. Because uh, I drop you a text and it's a little bit longer to get back. You Sorry. still do it? No, but you still do it, which I appreciate. But I know you're busy too. But how are you keeping on top of things? Um, you're very important, Jack Mullers. I just am. I just am. I don't, I try not to spend too much time thinking about like, because, you know, the kids I grew up with in high school and stuff, they'll like see me wishing Julia Chatterley Valentine's Day, right? Or see... Uh, an integration with Twitter and and they're like, man, like, what's that feel like and stuff. And to be honest, it doesn't feel like shit. And I don't, I try not to really think about that stuff. What I do hold myself accountable for that I will say, I think there's always been this overarching thesis about Bitcoin where there's Bitcoin is a mass uh, wealth transfer from the old elitist to new money. Um, and there's always been this thesis of is that wealth going to be evenly distributed? And the, the new elite, like, are they going to do good for the world? And I think the Bitcoin community has always been in that these people want to change the world. They have the world's best interest at heart and stuff. Agreed. And so I'm not commenting on my, like, monetary status as an individual. I'm just saying to have the privilege to, you know, ha what happened in El Salvador or to sit across from executives at Facebook and Google and capital group, um, I take that responsible or responsibility like very seriously. Um, I think I need to do good by Bitcoin and by this community because I, I'd like to think of myself or at least what I, I strive to be exactly that example. As a kid who dropped out of college, um, who had no real direction and found a life in Bitcoin um, and given Bitcoin succeeds and puts me in these types of positions that I'm going to do best by our species um, and by the project. And so that's the only thing I keep in mind when I remind myself like, man, you know, Jeff Bezos, huh? Um, I just keep that in mind. But outside of that, um, it, it's business as usual. I mean, the, the best approach is the practical approach. Um, and so I just take every single day. I try and do the best I can to win today and make sure I'm ready to compete tomorrow. That's it. 
Well, listen, you made my job very easy today. Okay, good. You just got to keep these stories for me. I got you. Uh, Jack, I'm super proud of you, man. And uh, I'm very happy that you're my friend and we get to hang out every few months and talk shit and talk about Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, you're very important. I think you're doing important work. Uh, I just can't wait to see where this all goes. Um, it's uh, I've It's been a pleasure to be part of that journey with you in and out here in Chicago, El Salvador. And uh, I enjoy just watching from a distance and seeing you crush it. And uh, you've become quite the storyteller. <laughs> Uh, man, just keep crushing it. Just keep crushing it. Yeah. Well, likewise, man. Um, I look at you the same way. I think it is one of the unique things about Bitcoin is, uh, the relationships you build and, uh, just watching everyone else kind of grow into their own businessman or husband or entrepreneur or whatever it is. So, uh, you as well, Pete, I mean, watching you buy the football club, you know, that was a childhood dream of yours and the podcast. I mean, look at this. Studio Malibu <laughs> that got the sun beaming on my sexy I know, face. It's like, uh, no, nah, I mean, that's the universe's way of acknowledging how good looking I am. It's, it's its way of acknowledging how fat I am. No, dude, listen, keep Appreciate crushing it. it. Love you, man. Love you. Keep too, buddy. doing what you do. And uh, every few months, we'll catch up and I'll find out. I'll whatever respond to your text quicker. <laughs> whatever crazy, well, Dylan, I'll get in touch and you can tell me other crazy shit you've been up to because it just. It just gets wilder and wilder, but I love you, man. Keep doing it, and uh, yeah, see you soon, brother. Love you too. Peace.